Hello, everyone, and welcome to this year's ESHG PECBIO workshop. My name is Jonas Korlach. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at PECBIO. Thank you for joining us today. We would like to talk about how PECBIO long read sequencing can be used to increase solve rates in rare and Mendelian disease research. While individually rare, Rare disease cases are common in the population, with about 1 in 10 individuals affected, and it is estimated that about 80% are genetic in origin. However, currently over half of the cases remain unexplained. Similarly, out of the 8,500 known Mendelian disorders, currently about 40% have an unknown genetic cause. It is our goal to demonstrate that with the more comprehensive and accurate whole genome that PECBIO HiFi can provide, we can demonstrate an increased resolving power. We believe that high quality whole genome sequencing is the future of medicine and that this will be the first of many impactful demonstrations. Here's the reason why we believe this. It has been shown over the years that more complete detection yields more insights, starting with karyotyping, then microarrays, and then short read exome or genome sequencing, resulting in increases to the now about 40% levels. So with a more complete detection of all these variant types, SNPs, indels, and structure variants, we can anticipate a greater explanation rate. This then brings us to HiFi sequencing, which has a better ability to detect variants from a more comprehensive human genome. The scientific community is now evaluating PECBIO HiFi data for identifying additional underlying genetic causes of diseases, and this is the topic of today's workshop. You likely know how HiFi reads are generated. In short, the polymerase reads in PEC biosequencing have become so long now, certainly well over 100 kilobases, to allow for building consensus from multiple passes on a smart bell template, leading to HiFi reads that are typically 15 to 20,000 bases in length and are 99.9% .9 or greater in accuracy. On the right, I compare the read accuracy distributions of the three major sequencing technologies. And you can see that PECBIO HIFI reads are very similar to Illumina reads, and they are extremely accurate, over 99.9%. This is in contrast to other long read sequencing technologies that are much less accurate. Secondly, the HIFI read distribution is very narrow, which makes the bioinformatics much easier and much faster because the algorithms can assume this very narrow range of high accuracies. This is also very different compared to other long read sequencing methods. In addition to the extraordinary accuracy, HIFI reads provide other advantages, such as even coverage, high genome completeness, allele resolution, and long range phasing. All these aspects taken together result in superior performance with respect to calling of all variant classes. Indeed, both the recent Precision FDA Truth Challenge version 2 the Genome in the Bottle uh, 0.6 benchmark, and including here the most recent updates, highlight PEC bio hi fi data having the best performance and with substantially lower variant calling errors in SNPs, indels, and SVs compared to all other sequencing technologies. So coming back to this table, what we have seen so far from the collaborations, presentations, and publications to date is that PEC bio continues this march of technology evolution and that more than half and perhaps up to two thirds of the cases can be explained through HiFi sequencing. This number could increase further in the future since the analytical tools and databases, especially for structure variants, will continue to improve over the next few years. And so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Susan Hyatt as this workshop speaker to present to you some of her research in this area and in particular here highlighting how long read genome sequencing can aid in the molecular understanding of neurodevelopmental disorders. Hi, my name is Susan Hyatt and I am a senior scientist at Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology in Huntsville, Alabama. And I'd like to share with you our recent study on long read genome sequencing for molecular understanding of neurodevelopmental disorders. And I have nothing to disclose. Our lab is interested in the genetics of neurodevelopmental disorders, or NDDs. These collectively affect about 1% to 3% of children, and although they are commonly, um, collectively common, individual genetic disorders are often rare. 
So the first line testing is often chromosomal microarray in these children, in addition to karyotypes or fragile X testing. And although these provide some answers, they don't in most cases. Um, many of these cases are still uncertain, and that often then leads to gene testing, either with single gene testing or panels or exome or genome sequencing. So we have done a lot of exome and genome sequencing in our lab over the last few years. And this is just an example of the probands that we have sequenced, which is over about 1500, most of whom have um, neurodevelopmental disorders or at least a rare disease. And as you can see here, over half the probands sequenced with exome or genome sequencing do not receive primary findings. We do find a deleterious variant likely related to their symptoms in about 26% of the cases. Another 15% have variants of uncertain significance or VUSs, but again, over half do not have any findings from genome sequencing. So we think about this 60% a lot. So we've found several approaches to try and get at this um, 60%. We have done reanalysis of our genomes over time to see if we can find um, new answers. We've submitted lots of genes to Gene Matcher to find new disease um, disease associated genes. But we also thought, what if our sequencing technology is just not letting us see some of these variants? And we know that um, many regions of the genome are just, um, are, are not sequenced well in short read sequence, with short read sequencing. And so we wanted to use long read sequencing to see if um, that can identify missed variants of interest. So we started with our CSER study here at Hudson Alpha. This is a group of about almost 600 probands that we have sequenced, but again, over half of them did not have findings. And so about 343 were left in that um, segment of the population. So we chose six proband parent trios who had neurodevelopmental disorders that appeared to be de novo, there was no strong family history, who all had a negative genome when sequenced in our research project. We then generated PacBio HiFi reads using CCS technology for these probands. We were shooting for a depth of about 30X in the probands and about 15X in the parents so that we could still see de novo variants well. So here are the six probands we selected for sequencing. You can see the major phenotypic features here, which are very broad categories, but often included ID, seizures, sometimes hypotonia, facial dysmorphism, et cetera. Many of these, again, in our study, they had either exome or genome sequencing, or sometimes even both that had no findings in our study. But you'll also see that many of these probands had other genetic testing done before they came to our study as well. So they have been on this long odyssey of testing. So we did generate the HiFi data, and we, we did get to the 30X coverage again in 15X in parents, and our average insert size is listed there as well. So several papers have come out recently that do show that long read data allows more accurate alignment and variant calling. Quickly, some of the things we found were that we had more high quality de novo SNV calls in the long read data, and we had less high quality indels compared to short read data. And that just reflects the error types or the error modes of long and short read sequencing. We did find better mappability in both triplet repeat regions and in low mappability regions of the genome. And I'll show you an example in fMR1 on the next slide. And we also found a more biologically relevant count of de novo allo insertions compared to short reads. So we, one of the main places we wanted to look when we first did the sequencing are at some of the triplet repeat expansion regions. And so here I am showing a view of the alignment of high fi reads and short reads in the five prime UTR of FMR1, which is a well-known developmental delay gene um, that has a triplet repeat expansion in the five prime UTR. And on the bottom, you can see that the short reads don't align very well. There aren't many there. Um, and they're, they're not showing any sort of insertion, maybe a three nucleotide deletion. But when you look at the high fi reads, which are much longer and align much better in this region, you can clearly see two different alleles, including a nine nucleotide insertion and a 69 nucleotide insertion. So in addition to FMR1, we looked at 30 some other um, curated regions uh, for repeat expansions, and we didn't see anything that looked causal in any of these probands, but we did see much better alignment in these regions. 
One other huge benefit to these long reads are that we were able to make trio binned hi-fi ASM assemblies that were high quality and phased. So um, I've highlighted the main genome contact N50 here around about 35 MB on average across all probands. And then I've shown the N50s on the right for each of the individual families, both paternal and maternal. And in some of our best assemblies, we are getting close to, we're approaching the N50 of HG38. So what did we actually find? What are the interesting variants that we found here? One of our probands had a de novo insertion in CDKL5. So at the top, I have the ideogram of the X chromosome where CDKL5 is on the P arm. This is an X linked gene that has been associated with dominant, um, X linked dominant epileptic encephalopathy and both loss of function variants and missense variants have been associated with disease. In this region, we found that our proband had a 7KB insertion just after exon three, you can see in the gene structure below in that multicolored line. So we wanted to, and, and we knew that this, um, this insertion was de novo. It was not identified in the parents, in either of the parents, either in their reads or their assemblies. So when we looked closer at this insertion, um, we found that it, again, lot was just after exon three, just downstream of exon three, and it was about seven KB. But interestingly, at the other end of that insertion, we found another copy of exon three. And so when we looked at, uh, when we ran repeat masker just on this insertion, we found it contained a poly T sequence and then L1 sequence, along with also an ALU element and um, a GA rich region. And so this appeared to be an L1 mediated insertion and it has two classic marks of the L1 insertion, which is L1 is inserted, um, but there's also a poly T and this target site duplication. So we actually have exon three and intronic sequence surrounding it duplicated here. But what was interesting is that this looked like a chimeric L1 insertion and there was some non L1 sequence included in there. And as we looked closer at this, we actually found that there was a partial L1HS insertion in just after exon three, but then some of the sequence um, at the other end of the insertion was actually identical to an intron in a downstream gene, PPEF1. So this is about 2.6 KB of sequence, and it's about 300 KB away from the insertion. Um, it's a really interesting mechanism. It has been described. Um, these chimeric L1 insertions have been described, but that was, it's a very fascinating find. So um, the take home though, is that we have this large insertion that is de novo and um, exon three might be duplicated. So I also wanted to sh first show you what this looks like in the hi-fi reads. So I'm showing here the alignment of proband, dad and mom's hi-fi reads in this region of CDKL5. And you can see the CDKL5 exon three at the bottom. So in dad and mom, you see reads aligning across the entire region here with no mismatches, indicating that they match the reference. However, proband has several sets of interesting reads. So at the top, you can see that reads align from the left side of the insertion through the target site duplication, and then include the insertion. And that represents the left end of the breakpoint. Just below that, you can see reads that start from the right end, align through the TSD, and then have the insertion. So that represents the right end of that breakpoint. And several of these reads, the ones with diamonds, are hard clipped. And so I just noted those here. You will also though see reads that align the whole way through, which are the wild tape reads. And so um, in looking at variation, looking at assemblies, hi-fi ASM assemblies that are both maternal or paternal, we saw that this insertion was only on the paternal allele. Um, also, if we look at SNVs just outside this region, we can see that as well. And that is also reflected here. So one other interesting thing we saw is that this de novo insertion is actually mosaic. So um, again, I'm showing proband dad and mom's reads aligned here, and this is only at the left end of that insertion. And I flagged some paternal and maternal SNVs in this region with either the pink or blue arrows. 
And what you'll see in those paternal reads at the very top is that some of the reads that are paternal do not have that insertion. And so it appears to be a mosaic insertion. So at this left end, we actually found that in five out of eight reads at the left end, they were wild type paternal reads that did not have the insertion. At the right end, about half of them did have the insertion and half did not. And so that just adds a little more complexity here and another reason why long reads are probably better able to see this. Um, again, the, the outcome here is that we think that exon three is duplicated in the proband and that could lead to a loss of function allele. So we wanted to see if that was indeed the case. And so we did RT-PCR in the proband dad and mom, and we found two different bands that were amplified. Although it's faint, there is a slight band that is a little bit higher that represents that 275 nu nucleotide amplicon that does have exon three duplicated included. Um, so we, we isolated both of these bands and sent them for Sanger sequencing and confirmed that the sequences shown here are what um, were actually produced in that proband. And so the frame shift is um, circled in red in the red circle. Um, and that is where the frame shift begins. And then there's a stop code on about 50 nucleotide, or, sorry, 50 amino acids downstream. And so we believe that's probably a loss of function allele. So in summary, in this proband, which was proband six, we identified a 7KB insertion in CDKL5, a known DDID or neurodevelopmental disorder gene. It was de novo. There was an L1 mediated insertion of a chimeric L1 transcript. And this is a mosaic insertion. And we also showed that this is likely a loss of functional allele due to the inclusion of the second exon three. And so we do believe this has something to do with the, the um, presentation in this proband. In one other proband, which is proband four, we found several large de novo structural variants. In all, we found 15 breakpoints that affected at least 16 protein coding genes across three chromosomes. And in this case, the um, HiFi ASM assemblies are really what was critical in figuring all of this out. And so I'd like to walk you through each of these chromosomes, each of these events. So the first thing that we identified was a pericentric inversion and a chromothripsis-like event affecting chromosome six. So in these dot plots, you will see across the x-axis is the reference chromosome six sequence, and across, down the y-axis are the derived, is the derived chromosome six from this proband based on the paternal context that we identified in this proband. So we were able to identify four, or, or HiFi ASM built four contigs that span the entire derived chromosome six in this proband. And you can see those aligned again on the left. You can see there are two breakpoints that are related to a pericentric inversion, which are labeled PINV1 and PINV2. You can see that the centromere has shifted, which is um, not noted by the asterisk there, has shifted down um, more towards the Q terminus of the derived chromosome six. What you'll also see though, is this cluster of breakpoints um, near Q23.1. And so if we zoom in on those, again, this is spanning two contigs, we again see the inversion breakpoints, but we see multiple other breakpoints, at least eight other breakpoints with these fragments labeled A through F, G, A through G. Um, and so you can see that several of them are inverted, several of them are all rearranged. And so looking at the sequence in detail, it does look like a chromothripsis-like event. And so again, the assemblies were what was critical into putting all of these pieces together. And so those assemblies plus manually looking at reads allowed us to put together this idea of what is happening here, where again, we have a maternal allele that looks wild type in the pink box, but in the blue box, we have a derived chromosome six on the paternal allele that includes a pericentric inversion and rearrangement of those segments labeled A through H to um, what is listed there below, starting with DCA, and some of those are inverted. In addition to this, probin 4 also has insertional translocations affecting chromosomes seven and nine. So again, here along the x-axis, you're seeing chromosomes seven and nine for the reference. And we are looking at the contigs along the x-axis that represent the derived chromosome seven and nine. 
And in each of these, you can see breakpoints of 7A and B and 9A and 9B, um, where sequence in the probands derived chromosome seven starts on chromosome seven. There's an insertion of chromosome nine sequence and then back to seven, and then the opposite on the derived chromosome nine. So that allowed us to put together this schematic of what's going on here, where again, the maternal chromosomes in the pink box um, are wild type. And again, this just represents um, actually 7P and 9P. But then on the derived paternal alleles, we have an insertion of about 3.6 MB of chromosome nine sequence into chromosome seven and an insertion of about 22 MB of chromosome seven sequence into chromosome nine. And in addition to that, there's an inversion at one of those ends. And all of those breakpoints are labeled there at the top. So in this proband, we found extensive structural variation. Again, there were 15 different breakpoints affecting at least 16, pro sorry, affecting at least six protein coding genes across three chromosomes. And while any of these events may be found in a healthy individual, the, the um, the combination of all of these in this one individual um, is very suspicious. And again, they were all de novo. So in conclusion, we've shown here that HiFi long read showed substantially better alignment to the reference genome and facilitated more accurate and more comprehensive variant calling than short reads. Our trio bin de novo assemblies are high quality and they're critical to understanding some of the complex structural variation that we saw. And while the rate of finding variants of interest is not quite clear, we found variants in two of six probands, which suggests that that, that amount may be substantial. The, the rate of finding variants may be substantial, even for cases that are genome sequencing negative. So with that, I would like to acknowledge that this was the work of quite a few people in three different labs at Hudson Alpha. Um, the Cooper lab has extensive experience in neurodevelopmental disease gene sequencing. And Jane and Jeremy's labs both have extensive sequence with ex extensive experience um, with PAC biosequencing and long read assembly of genomes. I also just wanted to mention that this work was recently published in HGG Advances, so you can find a lot more details there. And I would be happy to take questions if you would like to email them to me. I'd be happy to discuss. Thank you.